Hey guys, welcome back to Fix It Friday. So this week we're going to be working on the Sega Dreamcast, and this is the final console that Sega produced uh, before it got out of the console making business. This is from the late 90s to early 2000s, and for those of you that have never tried it, this is a phenomenal console to own and uh, collect for. I personally have lots of fond memories of playing Soul Calibur 2 with my friends until the wee hours of the morning on this thing. I mean, I absolutely love the Dreamcast. Um, so it's a better time than ever to own one because there's lots of things you can do to make one of these better. So, for example, on this particular unit, someone has already installed an optical disc emulator here, and this will allow you to very easily uh, play games from an SD card. So if your, you know, disc drive dies, it doesn't matter. You're fine. You're going to be able to play games on this using original hardware. Uh, you can also do things to replace the power supply and put in a quieter fan. But today, what we're going to be doing is installing this. So this is the DC Digital. This is made by Black Dog Tech, um, and it's a phenomenal upgrade to the Dreamcast. It gives you HDMI coming directly out of the back of the console, and it allows you to experience these games in the best possible quality using original hardware. All right, so let's get started with the install. But before we start, let me take a few seconds to thank PCBWay.com for supporting this week's episode. I rely on PCBWay all the time for PCBs that I need for my projects, and I can always count on their excellent pricing and fast turnaround times. But they don't just do PCBs, they also offer CNC machining, 3D printing, injection molding, and even sheet metal fabrication. So if you're designing your projects, then PCBWay has got you covered. Thanks again for your support, and now let's get back to this week's project. Okay, so before I start, I just want to go over some prerequisites related to, um, you know, installing this. So for one, uh, you can see that a number of mods have already been done. This was not done by me. This was done by someone else, but I thought I'd just demonstrate since they're here. So the original very noisy fan has been replaced with a Noctua fan and a 3D printed mount. So this is a really nice thing to do just to make your Dreamcast nice and quiet. Um, there's a Pico PSU installed instead of the original power supply. Um, I think this is a nice modification. I'm not sure if it's necessarily like a required kind of thing. The original PSU does work very well. And if you replace the capacitors on it, it's great. But I mean, all that being said, this is a very nice small form factor. And um, I certainly don't think it's worse than the original power supply. I would just say that it's, in my opinion, an optional kind of modification. Um, and then finally, we have a mode here. And uh, this is the device I was referring to earlier that lets you play games either from a solid state drive or from an SD card. And this one's currently configured uh, for the SD card. So if you're doing the DC digital install, you've got to look for a model VA1 version of the console. So that's really easy to figure out. If you flip it upside down, you'll see the number one circled over here. And that is the version that you're trying to find. Um, all that being said, most consoles are VA1s. There's a few VA0s from the launch period, and then at the very end of the console's life, there's a VA2. So most of the time, like, I don't know, maybe a good 90-something percent of them tend to be VA1s, so your chances of finding one are pretty easy. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take this thing apart. It only requires a Phillips screwdriver, so I'm not going to bother with uh, showing that on, on screen, because if you don't know how to use a screwdriver, well... This mod is not for you. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then we're gonna proceed with the installation. Okay, so now we're down to the motherboard and we're gonna get started with some modifications to the shell so that we can accommodate the new board. First thing we're gonna do is change the RF uh, shielding here, just trim some parts off. And uh, this is the top of the RF shield, so it just goes like this. It also doubles as a heat sink. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take a set of flush cutters, we're gonna just snip that here. This is on the back. And then with a pair of pliers, we're just gonna rock this back and forth and the metal just breaks right off. So this flex cable that comes with the kit, it's gonna route through that region. And so we just need to make space for it. And thankfully that's all we've got to do to the top part of the RF shield. Now we've got the bottom RF shield right here. Let me just take that out. And here, we're gonna remove two components as well. So this little area here, we're gonna remove. And that's also to make way for the flex cable. So you just very easily clip it. And then with a pair of pliers, you can just bend this flat and then rock it. And there we go, it comes right off. I'm gonna use my pair of pliers and just flatten this out. This is just to prevent any sharp edges from catching the flex cable and cutting it. Should be fine though. 
Okay, so now we've got this large piece here we need to remove to make way for the HDMI. And just like before, we're gonna take the pliers and flatten it out. And you can do this part with a vise. Um, I don't own one, so I'm gonna use my pair of pliers and just go back and forth slowly on this. Okay, and just like before, we're gonna take our pliers and just flatten this all out so that there's no pointy edges that are gonna bump into anything. Okay. So now there's a little bit of work we need to do to the bottom of the shell as well. The first thing is if you take a look down here, there's like a little nub over here. And I think this is a leftover thing from the injection molding process. And some consoles have it, some don't. Um, I think most end up having, having it though. So we're gonna go ahead and just use the flush cutters to, to trim that down. Okay, so the last thing we need to do is remove this little standoff over here. This gets in the way of where the flex cable is supposed to go. Okay, so that's it for the case trimming. Um, just looking at this console, I can see there's a little bit of dust here at the bottom. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up really quick. And then we're gonna move on to the next phase of the install. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is drill out a port for the mini HDMI and to do that, we're gonna use this little jig here that comes with the kit. And you can see that it has these four slots and five holes over here. So the way that you use this is that you set it up so that there's three and a half holes on the right here that are open. And you can see it pretty snugly fits into place. And then from here, we're gonna take a drill bit that's the correct size, and we're gonna drill two holes and then flip over and drill three. And that more or less cuts a decent enough hole that we can start trimming and make space for a mini HDMI port. All right, so I've finished carving out the port for the mini HDMI, and you can kind of just see how it looks now. And um, it's a probably one of the most time-consuming parts of doing this installation. I make sure I take my sweet time with it because if you go too fast or if you use a tool like a Dremel, you'll easily end up removing just too much material, and then you'll have this really ugly, unsightly hole in the console, and you know you just don't want to do that. If you take your time and uh, do it slowly and carefully, you'll carve it out just right so that it matches the shape of the mini HDMI port, which is what you can see here, and it looks nice and clean. So, you know, what I do after I drill out the holes is I use that flush cutter that I have, uh, you know, right over here, and just use that to break the little pieces just to open it up a little further. And then from there, I, I use this uh, scalpel right here just to just whittle the edges and smooth them out um, you can also use a file, and I think, honestly, a file is a little bit easier than using the scalpel. The reason why I like the scalpel is because I can curve these edges to match the mini HDMI a little bit easier, um, but there's nothing wrong at all with using a, a file. In fact, I think if this is your first time doing it, definitely consider using that method. Um, and when you get the hole to the right size, it should be a nice, smooth... Um, process of just putting it in. You shouldn't have to put it in with any force or feel like there's any pressure on the port. If there is, then the port might break uh, over time. And so you definitely don't want to do that. All right. So the only other thing I need to do now is just add this adhesive sticker to the bottom of the PCB. And that's just so that the um, PCB is isolated from the RF shield that it's going to be sitting on. Okay, so now that the board is in place, we're gonna mount it permanently to the shell. And we're gonna use these two screw holes right here. So to do that, I'm just gonna use a drill bit and uh, go straight through the metal and the plastic. 
And then once I'm done with that, I'm actually gonna take it out, clean all these little metal shavings so they don't make contact with anything. And then I'll go ahead and screw everything into place. All right, so now that this thing is attached to the board, or the shell rather, we're gonna go ahead and attach the Wi-Fi antenna, which is just gonna go right here on this little socket. And now we're gonna just swivel this around and tuck this in. And the antenna is just gonna go like right there. All right, so the main board is all set and ready to go. So now let's move on to the fun part of installing the flex cable. Okay, so now we're ready to do the hardest part of the installation, which is to install the flex cable. So the flex cable is going to sit more or less like this and Two sides of this DAC are uh, connected to the flex cable, as you can see here. And then this uh, is where the digital audio gets tapped, and it's going to be soldered in place right about here. So before we go ahead and get started with this, there's a couple of preliminary things we need to do. Uh, one is that we've got to remove these two surface mount resistors here, and then clean up that area with some solder braid just to make sure it's all you know clean and flat. We're also going to tin this capacitor here and uh, we're going to be tapping in right over here as well. And then finally, I'm just going to clean up the whole area with some alcohol. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Okay, so now we're going to get started with soldering on the flex cable. We're going to start over here with the audio section, and you want to line up the flex cable such that these three pins back here are not touching it and the first pad of the flex cable is touching the fourth pin over here. So what we're going to do is use this set of tweezers to hold the flex cable in place and I use this resistor array right here as just a nice little spot to hold things down and ensure that they're going to stay in place. And now I'm going to be using a very liberal amount of flux, you really need that in order to prevent pins from bridging each other. Or if pins do happen to bridge, you can use the flux to wick away excess solder and get them separated again. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the method I use to do that. Okay, so start off with a lot of flux. <clears throat> We're going to add like basically a droplet of solder onto the uh, chisel tip. That actually might have been a little too much. Let me just try a little bit less. Yeah, there we go. Just a very small amount. And right now, we're just going to try to tack these guys into place. Okay. And you have to listen to the sound of the flux. And if it's getting low, you can just add a little bit more just to make sure that everything stays nice and lubricated with the flux. All right, so that's a good starting place. So what I'm going to do now is switch over to my binocular microscope and then just look at this closely off camera. Um, I definitely recommend that you do this with some sort of magnification because that way you can make sure that everything is lined up right and you can make sure that there aren't any bridges in between the pins. So I'm going to do that more closely and I can also tell that some of these need a little bit more solder like especially in this region here and here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and then we're going to continue on to the next step. All right, so there weren't any bridges, but I did add a little bit more solder just to make these connections stronger because some of them were kind of marginal. Um, so now that that's all set, we're going to continue doing some more soldering here. So we need to attach the flex to this little resistor here and to this open pad. There we go. And then we need to solder to these two pads. This is where those resistors were. 
and it's important that you spend a little bit extra time here just to make sure you have a good connection. And I'm gonna come back to this later and show you how you can test to make sure all of these connections are good before you commit to actually plugging the thing in. So I'll add a little bit of flux here. And then just put my tweezers nearby just to make sure it's pushing down like that. Okay. Now we're also gonna solder right here. This is that, that pad, that ground pad that we were preparing earlier on the capacitor. You often need a decent amount of heat here. And I'm just gonna add a little flux just to make sure it's good. There we go. Okay, so those are all the connections on this section of the board. Now we're gonna move on to the DAC and solder to this uh, chip right here. Okay, so we're gonna follow the same steps as we did before. Um, it's just a little bit trickier because you've gotta align things on two sides. I think this actually might be a little bit easier if you're a right-handed person because I'm finding you can just kind of position right here on the left and then come in with your right hand and solder. I unfortunately am left-handed, so this does not help me. But what I'm going to do is hold it in position here with my right hand. Um, you can also hold on to these resistor packs too. That does help. And we're going to follow the same exact procedures as we did before. We're just going to add a small little droplet of solder onto the chisel tip, and we're going to work it up and down and just use an excessive amount of flux just to make sure that things don't bridge. I mean, if they do, it's fine, but you try to avoid that whenever you can. And right now I'm not caring very much about bridging. I'm just trying to get a good contact with the chip. Okay. Now let's add a little more flux and keep going. Okay, and then finally I'm going to tack this side into place. All right, so everything is more or less secured, and I'm going to switch to the microscope just as I did last time and make sure that everything is uh, not bridged and that there's enough solder. I, and just like before, I can tell I need more solder on a lot of pads, and there might be some bridges, but nothing major. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then we're going to come back and get this thing finished up. Okay, so I went over everything and there was like a tiny little bridge right over here, which I cleaned up. And like I said previously, I just needed to add solder to all these connections just to make sure that they were nice and strong. So I've gone ahead and done that under the microscope. And now we're just going to go ahead and clean up everything with some isopropyl alcohol. I also soldered one final connection here to this resistor. That was the last thing that needed to be done. All right, so now that everything's clean, you can potentially proceed to the next step. But certainly if this is your first time or if you have any doubts about what you've done, I recommend that you go ahead now and test your work and just see if you have any issues with contact or bridges. So to do that, what you want to do is have a multimeter handy and you can set it to continuity mode, which is represented typically with this kind of icon. And when you have the multimeter set to that mode, when you touch the leads of your probes together, you get a beep. So it's a very easy way to confirm that you have connections. So what you can do is, for example, if you want to test the connections from this chip to the flex, you can touch the legs of the, um, of the chip, like say right here, for instance, and then follow the tracks and see where it's connected. And so for example, on this particular set of pins, a lot of them are connected up to resistor packs. They're either connected to this set of resistor packs here or this one right here. So if you touch the leg of the chip and then you touch the resistor pack on each pin at a time and you get a connection that's good, then you know that, that everything is soldered correctly. You can also test for bridges this way by touching two adjacent pins and just making sure you don't have a beep. Um, 
All of this is much, much easier to do under a microscope because as you can see, all of this stuff is very tiny. But with a scope, you can easily see that you're you know, going from point to point and making sure that everything is good. So you can do that on the audio chip. You can also do this on the DAC. I also recommend testing over here on these two points as well because sometimes uh, if you're not careful, there isn't a good connection here. So to test continuity here, you can touch one of these two points here. Oh, I just did it. <laughs> and then if you touch the pins along this connector, you should hear continuity, which there we go. So that one's connected. And this one's connected, so that's good. So, so yeah, if you're new at this, I definitely recommend this as a way of just proofreading your work and making sure everything is good. I know it takes a little more time, but it's worth it uh, just to prevent any kind of damage or issues um, with the installation. All right, so now that this is all finished, let's go ahead and move on to the next step. All right, so we just have a little bit of soldering left to do, and specifically, we're gonna be soldering some wires so that we can activate the button combo that brings up the DC Digital's menu. So we have to solder wires that are about, I don't know, maybe like 10 or so inches in length. Uh, something a little bit longer than the Dreamcast will do the job. And uh, we're gonna solder right here at this point here, which is, I think, yeah, it's right next to R201, and there's this little arrow here. So this is the reset line right here. And then we're gonna solder onto these resistors right here, R601 and R602. So I've got a few pieces of copper-stranded wire that are tinned and ready to go. So let's go ahead and add those into place. Okay, so I'm gonna take a piece of heat shrink tubing and pass these three wires through, and it's just for cable management purposes, just to keep everything kind of neat and together. And now we're gonna go ahead and solder these three wires to the DC digital. This yellow wire here, this is the reset. This blue wire here, this is R602, and we're gonna solder that onto P2 right here. And then finally, this green wire here, this is R601, and that goes to P1. Okay, so we're good to go with that. Now let's go ahead and install the flex, which is gonna come around like so, and go in with the stripe here facing upward. I'm gonna try to do this on camera, but I'm not sure if I can do it. <laughs> let's see what happens. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna start reassembling the console and then we'll be back for a preliminary test to see if this thing is working. Okay, so I've got the console connected and we're ready to do a preliminary test. And uh, the only thing I realized after assembling everything is that I actually can't test this because I don't have the right power brick to go with the Pico PSU. So for now, I just have an original Dreamcast power PCB uh, installed in there and that's gonna be good enough for me to just test the DC digital and make sure that it's working correctly. So let's go ahead and fire it up and see what's going on. <clears throat> All right, well, that is definitely a good start right there. So if you boot up the DC Digital the first time, it normally boots up like this in interlaced mode. So that's pretty standard. I think it's probably in 480i if I had to guess. Um, so now let's go ahead and uh, exit the mode over here. So I believe I have to, can I do that? I'm not sure if I can. All right, well, <laughs> that's fine. I can still access the uh, on-screen display. So for the DC digital, what you wanna do is press X and A, and then the L and R button and start like this, and it lets you get into the um, DC digital um, menu here. And from here, we can do a bunch of stuff. We can change the resolution. So we're gonna change it to 1080p. And there we go, that looks a lot better right there. Um, the other thing we can do is we're gonna go into the video mode settings and we're gonna force VGA. So let's go ahead and do that.
and you can see the flicker is gone because now we're in um, VGA mode, so it's 480p that's scaled up to 1080p, and everything looks really nice and sharp. And this will work for most games. There's a couple exceptions like Hydra Thunder that don't, but for the most part, uh, you'll get games running perfectly with uh, with this mode here. So, all right, it looks like I can't exit the mode, but I do want to go here and do a quick test. Normally what you're supposed to do is go into the memory card menu, um, and unfortunately I can't do that because I don't have an SD card that's tied to this mode, but I'm going to try to show you anyway. So if you go into test slash info over here, and then just press the right trigger, what you should see is what you're seeing here. So all of these signal lines should show a heart, meaning that there's a good connection. If you see an X, then that actually means that there's a connection that's bad, or maybe it's bridged with one of the neighboring pins on the, on the DAC. And so you can actually use this information to figure out exactly which pin is bad, and then go back um, and then touch up that specific pin to fix the problem. So I'll put a link in the video description just with some troubleshooting information about the DC Digital, so that if you ever do have this problem, you can go ahead and fix it yourself. All right, so that's it for this video. I think, you know, it's really impressive when you combine the DC Digital with all of these other modifications. You really get a um, fully fleshed out console that can play the entire library that lasts forever, has a nice quiet fan. Um, it's, it's really the best way that you can play Dreamcast on original hardware in 2022. So hopefully you guys like this video. Um, I have videos out every Friday. And then of course, if you have a console that needs to be modified, or if you have one of these that needs to be installed, you can always reach me directly at oneuprestorations.com. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you guys next time.